surface of a giant ice cap, a city is buried. Today on the island of Greenland, as part of man's continuing efforts to master the secrets of survival in the Arctic, the United States Army has established an unprecedented nuclear-powered Arctic Research Center. Located in a wilderness of ice and snow, Camp Century is 150 miles from Thule its nearest base of supply. This is an ideal Arctic laboratory. For more than 90% of Greenland is permanently frozen under a polar ice cap which covers all but a few coastal areas of the island. Camp Century is buried below the surface of this ice cap. Beneath it, the ice descends for 6,000 feet. In this remote setting, less than 800 miles from the North Pole, Camp Century is a symbol of man's unceasing struggle to conquer his environment, to increase his ability to live and fight if necessary under polar conditions. This is the story of Camp Century, the city under ice. It was in May 1959, after more than a year of preparation, that a small party of army engineers conducted the final search to select a site for Camp Century. Listen now to the voice of Captain Tom Evans, the young officer who was in charge of the construction of the camp. This was the day we really got underway. Colonel Kirkering, commanding officer of the United States Army Polar Research and Development Center, was with me when we made the final reconnaissance. We needed a flat surface, a level with less than one degree of slope. This would minimize construction problems by enabling us to keep all of our tunnels on the same level. We finally picked this plateau, a smooth white plain of ice for as far as you could see. This was the closest location to Thule, our supply base, which would not be affected by the summer thaw. That first day, we sent out flags marking the boundaries of the camp. This is rugged country. Nothing lived on the ice cap. Not even seal or caribou survived in this climate. Our job was to cross 150 miles of ice, much of it split by crevasses, and then build a city under the ice, experimenting with new concepts of polar construction. It was several weeks later, at a point where the ice cap sloped down to a narrow strip of barren land along the coast, that our supplies began rolling in by truck for transfer to sled. To make this transfer possible, we'd had to build a three-mile road up onto the edge of the ice cap. We brought in everything this way. Construction materials, steel arches, clothing, nails, steel beams, prefabricated houses, lumber, food, even ice cream. In the months it took to build Camp Century, more than 6,000 tons of supplies were used. Even the vehicles we used at the site had to be transported over the ice on big bob sleds. We called these convoys of 10, 20-ton sleds heavy swing. Crawling up the ice cap at approximately two miles an hour, a heavy swing would reach the camp in about 70 hours if everything went well. We used wooden caboose-like trailers, wanigans, to house members of the construction crews for the three-day trip. Mukluk, a three-month-old Eskimo sled dog, went along as camp mascot 
strictly against regulation. Caterpillar tractors with extra wide treads pulled the heavy swing. Each tractor could pull from 50 to 100 tons. Finally, like a wagon train in the Old West, the first heavy swing got underway. At the same time, we used another type of smaller vehicle to transport an advanced party. These pole cats would average 10 miles an hour and make the trip in little more than half a day. A convoy of pole cats, each section carrying six men, was called a light swing. We also used light aircraft. Throughout the operation, these flights brought in key personnel, special cargoes, and mail. We couldn't forget anything. This wasn't country in which to turn around and go back. A compass was useless this close to the pole. Instead, our convoys followed a series of trail markings. Traveling in a Wanigan was a long way from the early tractor trains of the 30s with sourdough biscuits and warmed up beans. From the days spent loading the heavy swing, the men's faces were already deeply sunburned. During the trip and shifts, half the men rode and half slept. Navy type bunks were used for sleeping, if you could sleep in the 24 hour sunlight. First to arrive at the surface work camp were the aircraft. A few hours later, the pool cast pulled in. For the next several months, this primitive scene of crowded James Way Arctic huts with outdoor latrines was our home. Now the real job began. Altogether, I had four other officers and a hand-picked group of 11 non-commissioned officers to help supervise the military construction crew of Camp Century. Plans for the camp had been developed months in advance. The basic concept was simple. A system of 23 trenches would be dug into the ice cap and then covered with steel arches and snow. Branching off the main communication trench would be a series of lateral trenches housing complete research, laboratory, and test facilities. Modern living quarters and recreation areas and a complex of support facilities. Since transporting great quantities of diesel fuel over vast Arctic wastes was impractical, we would install a nuclear power plant. To be absolutely certain that work was progressing properly, I held nightly construction conferences. Each of the men assigned to me was an expert in some aspect of heavy construction.